I received the last 16 inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Max processor into the studio. This is going to end up as my personal machine. But based on running a lot of testing on this M1 Max processor, there are a lot of interesting revelations that I found out and I'm going to share them with you. In addition, because of all these machines I order, they're running on different processors. I'll be able to give you a better comparison between the M1 Pro and the M1 Max processor, the different RAMs on the system, how that may benefit you depending on your workflow, and also talk about the SSD, the size, and the speed as well. Let's find out together. This is Art is Right. Before we start, subscribe if you're new and hit on the bell icon so you'll be notified every time I upload cool new videos like this. This will be a comprehensive photo and video review along with benchmark various programs. Timestamp will be in the description below so you can jump to the benchmark and the reviews that you want to see. What I'm going to do is give us a comparison between the M1 Pro and the M1 Max now that I have all of them in the studio. And the focus will be on the M1 Max processor inside the 16 inch MacBook Pro to see how much more performance are we getting out of this top end processor. And what I can tell you right now is that the result has been really intriguing and interesting where it hasn't really improved everything across the board as much as I would expect. So you're going to find out really soon what I mean by that. Let's have a look at the test system reference that I have. So I ordered three of these Pro Machine in starting with the 14 inch base model. This is pretty much the base processor with the upgraded to 32 gigabytes of memory. And based on my previous review, if you watch it, you will know that I'm super impressed by the performance of that machine, the price point and also the weight. It's just that the screen real estate is a little bit too small for me. So I generally prefer the 16 inch model. I also got the 16 inch base with pretty much everything base configuration with just a slightly upgraded SSD to see how that would perform if that helps anything at all. But that system still has 16 gigabytes of memory. And the last system I got in, which will be my personal system. This is the M1 Max processor with 32 core GPU and 64 gigabytes unified memory along with a two terabyte SSD. One thing that I want to point out is that on these processors for the M1 Pro and the M1 Max, once you have reached the 10 core CPU, they're pretty much going to be the same for the 14 and 16 inch model. There's really not that much variation and the processing speed for all these 10 cores, as you're going to find out, are very similar to each other. In addition to this, I'll be comparing this to my various test system that I used in the previous video, starting with the Mac Pro that has a 12 core Xenon processor and also the Radeon Pro Vega 2 with 32 gigabytes of high bandwidth memory, which keep in mind that is the upgraded video card that is generally for a lot of intense video work. And there are cheaper video cards that Apple have put into that machine that is not necessarily the base model. I have the 16 inch MacBook Pro from 2019 that has the top Intel processor and at the time of purchase was the top Radeon video card and inside, although Apple has released another model in the interim that has a slightly even more upgraded video card, but the performance gain wasn't really quite as significant. And I also included two M1 machines, the Mac mini that has the full fan on the inside, which runs extremely quiet because the Mac mini is generally a really good standard bearer for all the other M1 machines and the way how they perform with any system that has a fan inside them. And I also included MacBook Air in there because it doesn't have a fan. And a lot of times when the system really heats up, the machines slow down the speed and the time really does increase. So the first thing I want to talk about here in this review is the SSD speed, which I think a lot of people are really too overly concerned about this. Here's the SSD speed test for all these various systems from the 16 inch MacBook Pro with the one terabyte one, the 14 inch with the 512 gigabyte, and also my latest one, 16 inch MacBook Pro with two terabyte SSD. So we take a look at this comparison in a chart, it'll be a little bit easier to see. I mean, let me put it this way. Don't worry about the speed. It's not that important. It doesn't really make that big of a difference at all when it comes to file swapping speed, because you may talk about like a gain of one gigabyte per second. Let me put it in perspective for you. On the M1 Pro processor, if you upgrade to 32 gigabytes of unified memory, the memory are already running at around close to 200 gigabytes per second on that one. So we're talking about a memory internally to the machine that's around 40 times faster than what your SSD can read or write. It doesn't really make too big of a difference. So choose the size of SSD that you want that you will need in the future, not what you're going to need today. And don't worry about the speed because here's the thing, even if you get 
one more gigabytes per second performance increase on a 512 gigabyte SSD wouldn't make that big of a difference because if you're copying that large amount of files all the time, that drive would fill in pretty much no amount of time at all. So it really doesn't make sense to really worry about that. Yes, it is slightly slower, but you can see that they're pretty much all within the margin of error within the range of each other, as you see in a chart right there. About the built-in display and calibration, I have already released an extensive video talking about this. You can check it out up here or in the description below. A lot of really great information about how one may go in and fine-tune a calibration on these new mini LED laptops, which I think they're probably one of the best laptop displays that ever shipped in a portable computer, bar none. All right, external display and calibration work just fine without any issues, so you're really good to go there. Just something to remember is that if you need to connect more display to the system, you want to have the M1 Max processor because they have a dedicated engine that can support more displays. If you just go with the M1 Pro, you can only link up two display to the system. And I'll probably make another separate video talking about external display hookup to the system just to kind of show and demonstrate that later on as well. Now let's really go into the real world benchmark, which a lot of very interesting information have actually come out from this. The first thing I want to point out is that on the M1 Max processor, if you go into the battery preferences under system preferences, you will find that under battery and under power adapter, you have the option to choose the energy mode. So you have the low power auto and also the high power mode. What I have done tests in is on auto and also on high power. And I'll give you the big spoiler right now. It doesn't make that big of a difference at all, if anything. So personally for me, if you have these M1 Max processors, just leave it to auto so that the system will manage everything for you. And you don't really have to think about, you know, the whole thing about how your machine is going to consume power, anything like that. Also, when you use in high power mode versus the regular standard auto mode, the battery life is pretty much about the same because I did an export on that and I'll show you that in a second too. First of all, we're going to talk about Lightroom Classic. And yes, I did the 1000 file import and also export. This is not just benchmark for benchmarking purposes. I am a wedding and event shooter because I go through thousands of files at a time. I also do architecture photography. This is a common workflow for me and it's based on my real world testing experience. The other thing about doing these two is that I can see how fast the machine performs, how the thermal envelope is at a machine, and it really gives me an insight into other aspects of the machine. All right, looking at this right now, Lightroom Classic, you can see that on the 16 inch, the M1 Max processor, I have the high power and the auto mode listed there. And there is pretty much almost no difference whatsoever between the two. And the time difference between these processors versus the base 16 inch one, it's not that big of a difference. And if you end up getting the base 14 inch with the eight core CPU, you're really looking at about maybe a minute, a minute and a half longer. That's why I say the 14 inch machine is a highly compelling option. This is a chart comparing this to the rest of the computer lineup that I have for comparison. So you can kind of see that there. Right now, what we're seeing is that the Mac Pro with 12 core CPU and 96 gigabytes of memory is still pretty much beating all these things out. But I think that based on the chart right now, we're looking at this in the wrong way. We shouldn't be looking at this based on the amount of memory, but so much just based on the amount of core inside the machine. Another thing that you have to remember about these M1 processor too is that I listed the full CPU core count right now, but what you want to do is generally subtract two out because those two cores that you're going to subtract out are the high efficiency cores. They're not high performance cores. Yes, they will help the system when it is under heavy load, when it's doing a lot of export, but they're not the hard worker inside the system. So what you want to do is always subtract two just to get an idea for how these whole thing kind of compare to each other. Based on this right now, you're talking about maybe about a six minute longer this comparing to the Mac Pro, but it's coming really close to each other. And this is pretty much beating the Intel machines out of the water and also the M1 that have come before it. Now let's have a look at the Export 1K. And yes, you can go grab a coffee while you're doing the export. That's perfectly fine. Personally, for me, I like to know how fast the machine can export because this gives me a better perspective for my deadline. For instance, I can choose to spend more time editing a few more photos and get it perfect or I need to go in to export them right away in order for me to meet the deadline when I'm delivering the files. And this gives us one of those minutia into the way how we would approach and work with our files. Comparing this right now, pretty much we're seeing no differences whatsoever between the amount of memory on the system and the amount of cores that we have. So between any of the M1 Pro processor and also any of the memory range, 
there's not that big of a difference. And I have a theory about this. I'll share with you in just a second here. Lightroom Classic Export, if we take a look at by the amount of memory, I mean, it does show, but it does seem like, hey, you know, more memory is going to help here, but this is not really a true reflection of it. Again, the better way to look at it is based on the CPU core on the system and throwing more CPU cores right now into Lightroom definitely does help. A few things I like to point out in this chart, the performance number we're getting for the M1 Pro and M1 Max, I don't believe represent the final number that we can get just yet. The conversation is very similar to when Apple released the M1 processor and Lightroom Classic has yet to be optimized for that silicon. It is the exact same conversation here. Once Adobe released a new version, I have a feeling we're going to see a number improvement and it's going to be just about the same for the M1 Pro and the M1 Max processor. However, looking at this chart, we have come really close to the 12 core Mac Pro and it may nudge even closer or even just surpass the Mac Pro by just a little bit. We shall see there. Let's have a look at 1K battery export and comparing between all the M1 Pro and M1 Max machine, the time are just pretty much about the same. Going between high power and auto mode doesn't really decrease or bump the time by that much at all. So I wouldn't even worry about that. Just set it to auto. The Intel machine obviously took longer. It is a less efficiency processor and it actually consumed much more power. And in the chart below, you can see the battery performance between the M1 Pro and the M1 Max. Based on my testing in high power mode and in auto, they pretty much ends up at the exact same number at 91%. So what this is telling us that for a CPU task, you're getting a high performance processor out of these machines and going between the Pro and the Max won't make that big of a difference when you're just doing these kind of tasks. If you're doing something with the GPU, it may change the way how the computer perform. So we're gonna do more testing of that down the road. Now with this in mind, if you get the 14 inch model, it has a slightly smaller battery. So the battery does drop down a little bit more. If you want a longer battery on the road, I would go with the 16 inch model. And the last caveat there is that the Intel model, the battery drops down by quite a bit. Super power hungry processor and also an older battery. But let me put it this way. I think that even if we put a brand new battery in there, we're still going to see the numbers drop into at least like the 60s or 70%. We're not going to see that much of efficiency coming out from that processor comparing to these Apple new M1 Pros and M1 Max. Fan noise, well, we're getting into the era now where Apple computer are going to be much more quiet. I really love that because the Intel one was the loudest of the bunch. Now with all these machines in comparison, I want to point out the difference between the 14 and 16 inch model. Because the 14 inch is smaller, it has a little bit less thermal envelope. The fan tends to kick on a little bit more. The fans run just a slight moderately louder than for instance, the 16 inch model, which for the most part has been really quiet when I'm running all these tests and really beating in the system. So just something to think about there. If you want a really quiet machine and you want a portable one, I would definitely go with the 16 inch model. HDR Merge in Lightroom. We're pretty much seeing the performance pretty much in line with each other about a second gain. I would call that margin of error between all of these computers that we're seeing here and comparing to the rest. This is already beating out the Mac Pro. It is a great thing. This is now the process that takes a lot of RAM and also CPU power. So we're doing a Lightroom panorama merge from 14 Nikon DA10 36 megapixel file to generate a 314 megapixel image. When we do this, the result, you're going to see something interesting here. When we add more RAM into the system, we're cutting a time in half about every single time we do that. So going from 16 to 32, you're cutting a time in half or almost half. And then going from 32 to 64, you're cutting the time in half again with no difference between high power mode and also the auto mode. So if you work a lot with large files, I would definitely upgrade the RAM to 64 gigabytes because it definitely shows a huge improvement, especially in Lightroom when you're doing all these merge. Here is it comparing it to the rest. And again, it still beats out the 12 core Mac Pro with even more RAM in the system. So this I think attributes very largely to the interconnect, meaning that the exchange and transfer speed of the RAM in the system on these M1 Max processors with 64 gigabytes of memory, it can run as fast as 400 gigabytes per second. And that is extremely fast, much faster than the RAM inside my Mac Pro. Let's now look at Lightroom CC. One of my followers will point out that Lightroom CC uses the system resources much differently. So I ran a test and I was extremely surprised. 
This is a number that I was expecting to see from Lightroom Classic, but we didn't. So what this is telling us right now is that Lightroom CC is utilizing assistant resources way more efficiently than Lightroom Classic. I'm gonna show you in a few charts coming up really soon. So what we can see here though is that regardless of the amount of CPU cores you have in the system, just giving Lightroom in general more memory does decrease the exporting speed and increase the performance. And as you can see there going from 16 to 32, we are increasing its speed by around close to 25%. And again, we're increasing its speed by another 25%, going from 32 to 64 gigabytes of memory. Now, if only Adobe would take the export engine from Lightroom CC and apply to Lightroom Classic, this would be the numbers that we can see from Lightroom Classic. And this is also the reason why I'm saying right now that I don't think we're having the most optimized version of Lightroom Classic for these M1 Pros and M1 Max processors just yet. Let's have a look at this chart that will pretty much explain everything that we need to know. This is the CPU chart taken from iStat menu, and you can see that there are three peaks right there. The first one is Lightroom Classic 1000 Files 1 to 1 Preview. The middle one is Lightroom Classic 1000 File Export. And the last one is Lightroom CC 1000 File Export. You can see that Lightroom CC clearly uses more processing power peaking into, I would say, the 90 range compared to when Lightroom Classic is doing an export peaking at only around 75% range and even less so around 60% when we're doing a one-to-one -one preview. That means Lightroom Classic has the opportunity to run way faster on these new silicons. Here's a breakdown for all the cores in the system and this is running the tests on the M1 Max, although if you have the M1 Pro, the base model on the 16 inch or the top upgrade on the 14 inch model, you're going to see numbers very similar to what I'm seeing right now. You can see there on the very top chart that the processor inside here is showing a lot of peaks and valleys, meaning that it's not really filling everything up all the way. For instance, you can see that those cores are not filled, these cores are not filled. These two efficiency cores are definitely not filled up in the way how they are with the Lightroom CC export there that you see on the bottom. So this is telling us that it's not really running at its full efficiency just yet. And this is pretty much showing you the exact same chart, highlighting the different parts of it. But let's take a look at that number again. I have a feeling that if you configure the machine the way how it is right now, there is a chance, it's not a guarantee, but there is a chance that Lightroom Classic numbers can look very similar to what you're seeing on the screen right now. And these numbers so far, when you get into like the M1 Max, this is exporting much faster than Lightroom Classic can, but not on the other two just yet. All right, let's move on and look at Capture One. For those of you who use Capture One, the import is still about the same. I have a feeling that Capture One is not fully optimized for these processors just yet, number one. And secondly, I feel that Capture One can go in and crank the CPU performance up a little bit more, especially during the import so that the previews generate much faster. But the way how Capture One have implemented this is really smart because a lot of the adjustment you do in Capture One relies on a GPU. So while it's using the CPU to do the preview, you can go in and start to adjust the picture right away. And this is a good thing to have. So when we compare this to the rest, this is now much faster than the Intel machine. And that's a great thing. Let's have a look at Capture One export performance. We can see clearly that the moment we increase the amount of GPU Capture One have access to, we are now increasing the performance and also decreasing the export time. So the chart you can see there is between 14 versus 16 core GPU, just a marginal difference there. And the 24 core GPU, I don't have that machine to run the test in the studio, but that is an estimate based on the 16 and the 32 core GPU version of the processor. So you can probably extrapolate it somewhere in between, which what you're seeing on the chart right now. Here's a comparison between all the other machines and the only video card that kind of beats us out right now is the upgraded video card that caused as much as a base 14 inch MacBook Pro inside the Mac Pro machine. So obviously a lot of good things are being done here. Let's have a look at Photoshop performance, especially with the M1 Max and 64 gigabytes of memory. I'm using Lloyd Chamber Test, and this is a script that he wrote. I'll put a link to his script in the description below. Thank you again for having me use this. Starting with Photoshop speed test, we can see between the 70 and 90% RAM utilization in the system. Giving 64 gigabytes of memory to these computers definitely does improve the performance. 
This speed test really focused on the CPU power in the system. So you're just kind of seeing the numbers right there. But what I'm really more interested in is how the larger file would perform. Here's a quick comparison between all the rest of the lineup. I mean, this is currently beating the Intel system already. And here's the Photoshop Medium 15.7 gigabyte files. You can see that pretty much as you go in to bump up the amount of RAM in your system, the time that it takes to perform that task pretty much cuts in half almost every single time. This is kind of what I was expecting to see out of this. So if you work a lot with large files or even just medium file size like this, it is worth it to go for 64 gigabytes of memory as a photographer rather than going with 16 and relying on a system swap because you're going to see your time pretty much almost tripling as you're seeing on the chart right now. And I also want to mention that if you work with a lot of composite, a lot of panorama merge and so forth, 15.7 gigabyte file, it's not an unfathom amount of number. It's pretty much a number that you can expect. And those of you that work with these kind of file size, you know who you are. Here's the number for the medium task compared with all the inner machine and it already beats out my 96 gigabyte Mac Pro. So this is really awesome. And lastly, let's take a look at Photoshop Huge. This may be a little bit more aspirational to some, but I know people have worked with these kind of large files before and you are going to be thankful if you have more RAM in your system because you can see there from 16 gigabyte that take over two minutes and 17 seconds to run this task. When you bump it up to 32, the time gets cuts down to a minute and 28 seconds just about. But when you really bump this up to 64 gigabytes of memory and there is no swap on the system whatsoever, we now have times down into the 19 seconds. I mean, this is getting to the point where if you upgrade to 64, you're constantly working on these large files, you are actually improving the performance by at least six times, if not even more on these systems. So it is definitely worth it if you are working with large files. Here is it comparing it with the rest, and it is now beating out my 12 core Mac Pro with 96 gigabytes of memory. This is really awesome. All right, Final Cut Pro, H.264 export, just to kind of see the numbers there. Because these M1 Max processor has two encoder decoder engine, we are now cutting the time for the export down in half. And this is still much faster than any other Intel machine. For example, faster than my 12 core Mac Pro with the upgraded Radeon Pro video card. This is really fantastic because it's now taking desktop class for video and really bring it into a portable machine. The only thing we have to wait for right now for photo app is optimization. And I'm really, really looking forward to that. And hopefully that will come sooner rather than later. HEVC H.265 export. You can see again in the M1 Max because of the double amount of the encoder decoder engine, the time get cut in half. Here is it compared to the rest. And also if you do a lot of work in ProRes 422, definitely get the M1 Max. It's not necessarily half the time that it takes the M1 Pro, but it's definitely a good amount of time reduction that you have to spend waiting for your computer to render all these files out. One more additional thing I wanna point out about Final Cut Pro my testing is that a lot of what I do are fairly simple edits. I use some filters, I use some transitions, some plugin, but none of them really tax the CPU, GPU, or the memory quite as hard. And so far, what I can say is that if you are a video editor, you can probably get away with the M1 Max 24 core GPU version and just go with 32 gigabytes of memory and you're gonna be just fine there. Now let's have a look at the best laptop Max for Pro and here are my recommendation for the configuration, starting with the CPU, GPU. We're now noticing that between the M1 Pro, once you get to that 10 core CPU mark and the M1 Max with 10 core CPU, they perform pretty much identical in CPU heavy tasks. When it comes to the GPU, this would ultimately depend on what you do. If you use Capture One, you may wanna go out for more GPU cores because you can gain that much more performance. If you're in Final Cut Pro, depending on the type of plugin you use, you may want to go for more GPU, but 24 or 32 is going to do the job just fine. When it comes to RAM, I'm a firm believer that at least 32 gigabytes, it's going to be really great for photographers. If you don't need that today, you may need that down the road. And if you end up keeping your laptop for a very long time, getting 32 gigabytes of memory, it's going to make this a much longer lasting machine compared to if you just get 16 and you're finding out that you're running into bottlenecks down the road. SSD, 
Don't be concerned about the speed, but be more concerned about the capacity that you are going to need in your future projects. Don't configure the SSD size for what you're going to need today or tomorrow, but think about the SSD size you're going to need down the road because you want to have a machine that has better longevity and this is one way that you can really increase the lifespan of the machine by knowing that you're going to have enough space for you to store your creative projects on there or work on it really fast. Because the other thing is that right now, there are no external SSDs that you can plug into the system that can run as fast as these internal SSD yet. So get the size that you think you're going to need in the future. The perfect medium and sweet spot for most people I think is a one terabyte SSD. For me, a two terabyte is the perfect balance between the price and also the storage capacity. I find that in my multiple years of using two terabyte SSD internally, that tends to be the sweet spot for me, but you're going to have to determine that on your own and specifically for your workflow. Speciality. Based on what we have seen, if you want to get the best price per performance out of these machines, then I would configure the machine based on the creative tasks that you do and the program that you use. Going out there, if you have the budget and maxing everything out, it's not necessarily a good way to maximize the price per performance ratio for these computers. So let's have a look at the photography creative area. So starting out, if you're using Adobe products such as Lightroom CC, Lightroom Classic, and you're just really bringing the images in, doing some basic color correction and exporting them out, you're not really doing composite or anything, I would look at the first two columns, go with the base 14 or the base 16 inch model, and you can even just stick with 16 gigabytes of RAM and you're gonna be fine. However, if you think that down the road you're going to do some composite or you already do that, you work with large files, you do panorama merge, then I would definitely consider the next four columns over. And I have this broken down to 14 and 16 inch models. So there is the budget and the optimal configuration. So the budget would be the base processor and upgrade to 32 gigabytes of memory. The optimal configuration would be to go with the M1 Max with 24 core GPU and 64 gigabytes of memory. Same thing with the 16 inch model, go with the base processor. 32 gigabytes of memory for the budget one. And if you want the optimal, go with the M1 24 core GPU and upgrade to 64 gigabytes of memory. And remember, minimum one terabyte SSD because you are going to fill these things up fairly fast. One last thought for these M1 Max 24 core GPU is that most Adobe programs, when you're really using it, doesn't really utilize the GPU quite as much. So going with 24 core is a good way to save on the money a little bit there and then upgrade the RAM on the system, which is gonna be much more beneficial as you're seeing from the test. If you're using Capture One, definitely go for the M1 Max and the amount of GPU core between a 24 and 32, there is going to be a difference in the performance. Although I think that if you already go in M1 Max, you're gonna get a good performance out of it anyway. It just depends on how fast the CPU can be utilized for exporting. And with regards to RAM, 32 or 64 gigabytes will do just fine. Lastly, when it comes to Final Cut Pro, definitely get the M1 Max because of the double encoder decoder engine. That definitely does make a big difference when you're really trying to get your project out. The number of GPU cores, you can go between 24 and 32. That will work just fine. The number of memory so far in my testing between 32 and 64, it doesn't really make too big of a difference there, but I'm sure someone will probably use a plugin that requires more memory and will get use out of a 64 for instance. So. Anyway, I'll leave that up for the people who are doing a lot of video testing out there. So now that we have seen the comparison between the M1 Pro and M1 Max across different type of configuration, and I feel that the three configuration that I have purchased here represents the best combination to do all these testing for you guys because it tests the different strength of each machines, and now I can make a better recommendation for you. What we have seen so far, Apple have done a really amazing job. I really love this new display because it is probably one of the best laptop displays out there and it is much better than their display of the past. The processor, it's extremely efficient. The battery lasts for a very long time and the thermal envelope for these are really just amazing because the fan doesn't kick on quite as much. The machine doesn't run super hot all the time. I mean, what else can you really ask for? The only thing that we are waiting for right now to happen is for the other software companies such as Adobe, such as Capture One, to really release an optimized version that can take full advantage of these processors. And I think that when they do, we're going to see a much larger performance jump than what we're seeing right now in the tests. 
So anyway, I hope that you find this guide helpful in choosing the configuration and also highlight some of the things and the differences between the M1 Pro and the M1 Max and that you find a machine configuration that is best suited for your creative workflow and creative needs. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below. Give this a like, subscribe and hit on the bell if you're new. And remember, in art we trust.